In 2007, when every next-gen JRPG fan was getting their hands on Blue Dragon and waiting with anticipation for the release of Lost Odyssey and Tales of Vesperia, one game snuck into its release on the Xbox 360. It was a strange game that captured the minds of millions of RPG-starved 360 owners with its gorgeous cel-shaded graphics and a bizarre premise. And while it never became an overly popular game lauded the world over, it did garner a cult following that fondly remembers their time with its enchanting style. This game is known as Eternal Sonata, or Trusty Bell, Chopin's Dream, in Japan. This vibrant game is most well known for being inspired by the music and life of Frederick Chopin. So inspired, in fact, that the entire game takes place inside his dying dream. No, it's true. Everything around us is all a part of my dream. Even you are just a product of my imagination. Before the release of Eternal Sonata in America, game director and head writer Hiryo Hatsushiba conducted many interviews talking about this eccentric game. Most interviewers at the time asked about the gameplay and how the US version differed from the Japanese version, or why his studio, Tri Crescendo, decided to develop for the Xbox 360. While every interview had their own distinct questions, they did all have one consistent burning question. Why make a game revolving around classical 19th century pianist Frederick Chopin? In an interview with GameSpot, Hatsushiba had this to say in response. People who play games and people who love classical music are not necessarily sharing the same type of interests. Most people in Japan know the name of Frederick Chopin, however most of the people who know of Chopin think he is just some kind of great music composer without knowing any more about him. Most of them have heard Chopin's music, but not a lot could put his name to it immediately. By creating a colorful fantasy world in Chopin's dream, I was hoping that people would get into this game easily and also come to know how great Chopin's music is. You're a guest in our dream world after all. That's not something that happens every day. <laughs> By starting at the end of the famed composer's life, the game asks many intense questions. What do we see in our final moments? How can we sum up our complicated lives in such a short span of time? And how do we make an impact on a world we, in the grand scheme of things, barely get to experience? The answers lie within the fantasy world created by Chopin's fading brain, lightly inspired by the people, important events, and personal interests in his life. Eternal Sonata's dreamscape world is a gorgeous, vibrant, cel-shaded marvel even 10 years after its release. The amount of detail and range of colors in every area is astounding. It's honestly enjoyable just standing in a town or a dungeon, listening to the gorgeous score while watching the world exist around you. This artistic sensibility, that of finding beauty in the world and attempting to capture it, is present in many aspects of the game, from the narrative, the dialogue, even the minigames. All of it relates back to larger themes of art's connection to life and death and free will versus destiny. Clearly, there was a lot of passion put into this game. While that passion is often infectious, it does come with some noticeable downsides. Playing Eternal Sonata is like talking to a Chopin superfan. You can feel their compelling passion as they describe the composer's life and significance, pulling up song after song and giving you the detailed backstory about why this piece matters. They even tell you personal stories of what Chopin's music means to them and how it makes them feel. While you're happy for them and glad they've found meaning in this artist, they aren't doing a good job of making it accessible. It's just too much information thrown at you with little regard for your own understanding or appreciation. If the goal was to get people interested in Chopin, I think most players could only really relate to the artist on an aesthetic level as opposed to an emotional level. Ultimately, Eternal Sonata is an impenetrable love letter to Frederick Chopin and the power of art. Unfortunately, it gets lost in its own passion and fails to create something cohesive and thematically accessible. 
Nevertheless, it is an enjoyable experience that shows how creativity in game creation can lead to one-of-a-kind experiences. Eternal Sonata begins where all great stories begin, at the end. We first see our main character, Polka, jumping off a cliff to her death. We then turn back the clock to see her as a child. This cold open does intrigue, but only comes into play at the very end. More details on this later. We also see famed composer Frederick Chopin at the end of his life. As he spends his final hours on Earth due to complications with tuberculosis, the game lets the player experience the dream world he's created in his mind, a world he exists within and is cognizant of the fact that it's a dream. This dream world is a vibrant fantasy land with its own nations and conflicts. Polka is one of the many people who exist within this world. She is a young girl who makes her living selling floral powder, a natural remedy with healing properties. She also lives with a terminal illness. In this world, those with deadly diseases gain the ability to use magic. They can cast spells and heal others, but at a cost. Since magic is associated with the terminally ill, the general public is afraid to be near people like Polka, worried that they might catch the illness. To make matters worse, Polka's floral powder is no longer selling due to its high tax rate and the introduction of mineral powder, a state-supported healing item that has no taxes on it. I'm about to end this man's whole career. Now, I don't mean to be rude, honey, but floral powder just isn't useful anymore. <laughs> no, it's not. This place used to be much more beautiful. Polka soon meets Frederick, who kind of just randomly appears. They talk about how they both are near death and ponder their meanings in life, which inspires Polka to do something about her situation. She decides to travel to Forte Castle to ask Count Waltz to lower the taxes on floral powder. Chopin joins her because, well, he felt like it. Along the way, they're joined by Allegretto and Beat, two well-meaning thieves who hope to provide for the needy in their town. Viola, a sheep farmer who joins them because tax is bad? And finally, Salsa and March, two forest guardians tasked with protecting a go-go forest and the creatures within named Agogos. These Agogos are used to create mineral powder. If you couldn't already tell, mineral powder is kind of a bad thing. During their travels, the party meets up with the rebel group Andantino, headed by Jazz, Claves, and Falsetto. This group aims to rise against Forte and Count Waltz, since they know the truth about mineral powder. This artificial healing item is addictive, and after too many uses, turns people into mindless creatures. Count Waltz aims to create an army of destructive and obedient monsters to invade the neighboring kingdom of Baroque. Realizing the horrifying truth, the party's new quest is to travel to Baroque and inform the king, Crescendo, of this evil plot. With Crescendo's help, Polka and friends may be able to stop Count Waltz, and at the same time, Polka may be able to make a difference in the world before her time is up. This narrative might just be the weakest element of Eternal Sonata. This isn't from a lack of trying or a lack of things going on, rather it's an issue of pacing and focus. The story takes a while to get going, as it's only about halfway through the game when the party finally realizes that Waltz is bad and they need to stop him. Because of this pacing, the initial narrative threads take a back seat for the majority of the adventure. What begins as a story about young people on a quest to lower taxes, exploring their personal struggles, hopes, dreams, etc., is suddenly sidelined by the introduction of Andantino at the halfway point, becoming more about the fate of two warring nations, a vapid love triangle, and plenty of political intrigue to go around. The latter cast of characters from Andantino are nowhere near as interesting as the initial party, and they have barely any development before they are thrust into emotional situations the game wants us to care about. Why did you have to die?! But because the narrative decides to focus on them until the last hours of the story, we lose a lot of the initial connection we might have had with Polka and the others. 
While the game still tries to develop the original cast during the middle section, that time can get overshadowed by the rushed Andantino developments, who we've only known for a few hours before the capital D drama starts. At the same time, they want to develop Chopin's own emotional development and existential dread, which, like with the main cast, is most apparent in the beginning, kind of dropped in the middle, then ends with his main conflict as the main focus. What makes matters even worse is that Chopin has nothing to do with the story. He just kind of stands around and occasionally questions his existence, while the rest of the party has actual stakes in the events of the narrative. The themes and overarching narrative are about Chopin, but he has no impact on the internal adventure. He literally could be removed from the majority of the game and it would play out the same way. While the game does reconcile with his existential involvement in the world and the fact that he is perceiving his own dream world, it comes too little too late for my taste. More on that later. This change in focus wouldn't be a huge issue if the characters were likable, but they're so underdeveloped it's difficult to care for them, especially the party from Andantino. It becomes very clear that most of these characters exist simply as metaphors or to spout philosophical talking points. The most likable characters in the cast are also the least important. Viola has literally no reason to be there other than to be the third wheel in a freezing love triangle. Yet she's the most charismatic and likable of the group. Hey, are you two trying to make me angry? I'm in third place out of three players! You can't tell me that deserves a bronze medal. Not to mention one of the most powerful characters in combat. Salsa and March are also fun and very powerful, but Salsa exists solely for comedic relief and March just kind of joins the party near the end just because she felt like it. Polka is a great character on paper who I wish didn't fall by the wayside halfway through, and Allegretto and Beat's brother-esque relationship has its cute moments at the start, but beyond that, the cast is generally flat and used more to expound philosophical questions rather than discuss their lives, hopes, and dreams. The narrative is trying so hard to tell so many different stories that it can't possibly give all of them the proper spotlight. It has everything in the kitchen sink thrown into it, and there's clear passion behind the characters and their arcs, but there's just too much of it to make it remotely cohesive. And because of this choice, the characters and their stories suffer in the end. When the characters aren't focusing on the main task at hand, or are robotically standing around staring at each other with blank anime expressions, they're pontificating upon the philosophical whims of the world. In other worlds, they talk like they just stepped out of a Philosophy 101 class. The amount of water is the most important part of creating waves. That can be said about people as well. There are many things in this world that can charm people's hearts, just like the moon charms the sea. Things like wealth, vanity, status, image, and power. People there are many things, things in this world that can charm people's hearts, and as the earth grows, the waves grow bigger, bigger and stronger. This is probably too hard for you to understand. I guess. Oftentimes, the characters stand around and talk about the evils of the world, compare people to ocean waves, discuss how humanity destroys the beauty of nature, the meaning of life, how power corrupts, etc, etc. At a certain point, these speeches become more comical than anything, as they're often spoken by children or in awkward places that don't make sense. And while every character has one of these deeper themes to talk about, they never really go beyond just pointing out the theme or pointing out the problem, but rarely offering a solution or choosing to delve in any deeper than a surface level reading. These long-winded speeches and surface level philosophy also reveal something else about Eternal Sonata. Subtlety is not its strong suit. Do they think they'll start a revolution just by declaring they oppose the government? While this is fairly common for Japanese media, where characters often express their emotions in obvious and loud ways, especially in popular media from the country, here it feels especially jarring. They spend long periods of time going into great detail about the themes the story is already touching on. It feels like the cast are just one step away from ending their lines by looking at the camera and winking. Despite being a 20 to 30 hour JRPG, which is pretty short for the genre, the story feels like it drags on due to the inconsistent pacing and the awkwardly directed cutscenes. There are so many awkward pauses, unsuccessful attempts at humor, and bizarre body movements and camera choices. While it could be argued this adds to the dreamlike quality, 
Nothing weird enough happens to justify the snail-like pacing. The ultimate culprit in the sluggish pacing is the famous 8-minute cutscene. Spoilers for a 15-year-old game, but only a few hours after meeting Claves, she is tragically assassinated. In her last agonizing dying moments, the game gives her the floor to tell us all about her character, her internal conflicts, and why she made her choices. In order to give us even more context, they show us various moments from the past, which are cutscenes we've already seen. In fact, they almost show the entire cutscene we just watched beforehand in full. And just when you think it's over... Now go! Fly! But your destination isn't Forte anymore. It's Baroque! It's done. She has just a few more lines before finally passing on. Just in case you didn't understand the entire past five minutes of unending dialogue and repeated cutscenes. This moment exemplifies the entire Eternal Sonata narrative experience. It's full of awkward physical acting, monologuing about life and death with little to no subtlety, all while attempting to get us to care about a character we have little to no knowledge of. This may be hard to tell, but I genuinely hate to come down so hard on this game because I truly admire what it's attempting to do. It's trying to explore the power of art and different realities, seeing how Chopin could have created a world just as beautiful and complex as his music in an effort to help himself pass on to the next life. You can feel this love and care in the world design and art direction, which is nothing short of stunning. Even on hardware from two game generations ago, Eternal Sonata still captures the eye with vibrant colors, complex designs, and detailed areas that truly feel lived in. The colorful world is saturated, often choosing bright greens, blues, reds, and other colors that stand out. Even the darkest dungeons have wonderful lighting that create vistas that are hard not to admire. Hatsushiba conveys this love by noting in an interview, rather than creating a realistic world, I wanted to create something similar to a painting. With that in mind, we use lots of natural objects focusing on rounded, sweeping lines. We were aiming for a vividly colored fantasy world. I believe that we have something which is rich, warm, and natural, with a calming and soothing atmosphere. The music is equally just as gorgeous, comprising a mix of original orchestra pieces and beautiful covers of Chopin's work. Everything from the battle theme, the town themes, and even dramatic cutscene music is expertly crafted so as to heighten every scene it's a part of. This is especially true of the interlude sequences between each chapter where the game takes a moment to teach the player about specific moments in Chopin's life. The sequences are scored with tracks that the chapters are named after, with the written narration explaining where and how these songs were created. These history lessons are written with such clear love for the material, using poetic words that convey an undeniable admiration for Chopin's work. They're also accompanied by beautiful photography of Poland and France, providing visuals for the vistas Chopin visited in his life. These sequences work well to provide the average player with some background on Chopin's life. They provide context for the events of the game and connect the similarities between Chopin's dream world and his real life. I know I appreciated them, as they helped me to learn more about Chopin himself, who I had little to no knowledge of beforehand. These sequences are also used to bookend each chapter, giving you time to reflect on the events of the game and take a bit of a breather. It's all a part of Eternal Sonata's attempts to create a game for players outside the hardcore gaming audience. It's a slower moving RPG with linear areas and plenty of cutscenes. The pacing would work if the story was more engaging, but the attempts to make the game more accessible are admirable all the same. You can especially feel this accessible goal in the unique combat mechanics. 
So, how about we go around? In Eternal Sonata, combat is easy to pick up and understand, especially for veterans of the genre. You encounter enemies in each area as they wander around the linear paths, waiting for you to run into them. The combat is a hybrid between a turn-based system and a real-time system. You and the enemy still take turns attacking each other, but within your turn, you're free to move around within the allotted time frame. You can wander the battlefield, use an item, and attack enemies. When attacking, you press the A button repeatedly for basic attacks, and the Y button for powerful special attacks. This button mashing combat is given a little bit more depth about a third of the way through the game when you unlock the Echo Meter. This meter builds as you perform normal attacks, and is used to power up your special attacks. The bright light within me is a part of all things that shine! Supernova! So usually the best strategy is to just pummel an enemy and end with a flashy special move. Of course, you can use your party members to build the gauge to its max, then use the most powerful party member to lay a decisive blow. When it's the enemy's turn, Eternal Sonata takes a cue from the Mario RPG games and lets you guard by timing your button presses. This helps to reinforce the musical themes by getting you to follow a beat of sorts, while also keeping you engaged in the fight. Lastly, there's the light and dark mechanic. Within each arena are areas of light and dark. These areas affect not only what moves you can perform, but can even transform the enemies. So what at first seems like a small mouse can suddenly change into a hulking monstrosity with much higher defense and attack power. The key to winning fights is strategic positioning within the light and dark spots, and timing your blocks correctly to conserve your health. Every area comes with new beasts who require you to learn new block timing and shifting areas of light. The only problem is that there isn't a huge variety of enemy types or arena layouts. So about halfway through a dungeon, fights can become tedious and repetitive. The dungeons themselves are interesting environment puzzles, requiring you to memorize map layouts and mechanism locations. While interesting at times, I often resorted to following a guide due to my lack of spatial awareness. But these dungeons overall help to relieve the linearity of most areas. The biggest issue with the combat is that after a few hours, you've kind of seen everything the game has to offer. While you do unlock party levels that give you more options, like a counterattack or more special moves, these additions don't add up to much in the long run. These party levels are also unlocked based on story progression, so you're kind of forced to stick with one for a long time. Just like the lack of variety in enemy types, there's also a lack of options in combat. You only have access to four special attacks, and your movement options revolve around the placement of light sources. After a few fights with each party level, you've seen everything that level has to offer, and have to wait five or so hours before you can advance far enough in the story to unlock more options. This deliberately paced progression does line up with the game's intention to be more accessible, but it does make it somewhat lethargic for veteran JRPG players like myself. The best and most sizable additions come with Party Level 6, which you unlock from the optional dungeon, which you most likely will only play during your second, more difficult playthrough. <laughs> At level 6, you unlock the ability to chain special attacks between your three party members, while at the same time, the button prompts change randomly. This not only leads to devastating combos that feel satisfying to pull off, but you also are required to pay attention again, since your special attack button could change from Y to X, or your block button could change from B to Y. It's just a shame that this feature is something most players, including myself during my first playthrough, will never experience. Many of the most interesting elements of the game are just as secretive, often hidden behind a second, more difficult playthrough called Encore Mode. Take for instance the score pieces. These are items you find randomly throughout the world that carry short pieces of music on them. You meet random NPCs in various towns and dungeons and attempt to play duets with them by matching the right score pieces to their own musical pieces. If the music you create sounds good, you'll receive an item. This side quest is how you receive some of the most powerful items and accessories in the game, by the way. 
While interesting on its own, I can't really imagine someone completing this side quest or any of the others without a guide. This is because finding the score pieces can be tedious or just plain obtuse, and you cannot complete this mission in one playthrough. You need to collect as many score pieces as possible your first time through and match them with the right people. Then start your second playthrough where you find new people to play pieces with and discover additional pieces. I don't have a problem with this method inherently, it's just a choice that comes with a level of genuine confidence that I at once admire and am frustrated by. The side quests and a requirement to play through a secret New Game Plus mode called Encore mode where all of your items and party levels carry over, but combat becomes way more difficult, plays into the game's attempts to be more secretive and encouraging more exploration of its mechanics and world. The problem is that so much of it is hidden, and yet the world itself is not interesting enough to make it worth exploring. This confident obscurity extends into the complicated mixture of themes and logic. Eternal Sonata is attempting to give a voice to so many large ideas and societal issues, yet it just doesn't have the time or the focus to truly expand on all of them. There are existential concerns like the meaning of life, separating art from life, how art imitates life, and even following your passions in the face of adversity. There are also more grounded issues juxtaposing the flamboyant art. These include classism, tax laws, political strife, revolution, exploitation of nature and labor, dying for what you believe in, love triangles, and even religious conflicts. It's no wonder you're confused. While all admirable and noble topics to explore, none of them are given enough screen time to truly make an impact. They also rarely have an impact on the gameplay itself. The combat is based around timing and strategy, reflecting the musical nature of Chopin's life. But beyond these combat mechanics, everything about the story remains separate from what the player actually does in-game. This is why I feel the narrative never fully comes together by the end. This next section has spoilers for the rest of Eternal Sonata. I believe that this is going to be my final journey. But my final destination is shrouded in darkness. No matter how hard I look, I cannot see it at all. The road does lead to somewhere. Near the end of the story, the party finally confronts Count Waltz and narrowly defeats him. Not before his assistant takes an evolved form after consuming powerful mineral powder. He turns into a hulking monster that escapes through a portal, taking Count Waltz with him. The party chases after them and end up in Elegy of the Moon, the place where the souls of people who died from mineral powder end up. It's an eternal void where these poor souls are forced to live out eternity as formless spirits. The party goes through some trials and extra dungeons to access the final area. After defeating both Count Waltz and his monstrous assistant, another portal is created. This one transports the party to a destroyed version of the village where Polka grew up and where our journey began. Chopin finally has something to do in the story, and has reached the conclusion of all of his existential dread, that the party are fictional characters created by him in his dream world, which itself is keeping him from moving on. The only way to complete his destiny is for everyone to kill him. Then let us test it. Whether I... No. Whether my spirit can become a lance. Capable of piercing through every one of you. We'll see if I'm truly such a weak human being. This entire world is my dream. I will not let you destroy it! After a somewhat difficult combat encounter, Chopin is dead. I was not able to defeat you. After all, I'm glad. And the party begins to mourn. That is, until Polka remembers her own destiny, which is to die as well, and she jumps off of the nearby cliff, 
bringing the narrative full circle from the beginning of the game. Yet, instead of dying, Polka descends to the field from the opening as a young girl again, spending time with her mother as Chopin gives a final speech encouraging her and kind of summing up the themes of the game. Isn't it pitch black around you? Isn't the world covered in darkness? Now, Polka, come. It's two o'clock in the morning. The time for you to blossom has come. Polka is called back by Chopin's final thoughts and returns to the cliffside to live with Allegretto and the others, returning the town to its former beautiful glory. The final shot is of Chopin's dream world soul rising out of his body to play one final piece inspired by Polka. Initially, this ending came off as jarring to me, as it reconciles with the specific themes introduced in the first five hours of the game, but are barely touched upon throughout the majority of the narrative. Despite having a relatable and ultimately kind message, it feels bizarre and has less of an impact given how disconnected the ending is from the past 10 to 15 hours. These final moments imply that the dream world is in a loop of sorts, a personal purgatory for Chopin, and the only way to break the cycle is for Chopin to choose to pass on, to face his destiny of dying. At the same time, Polka must face her own death with hope and bravery, not fearing what may be on the other side. This is shown by the change in her dialogue in the repeated scene of her diving off the cliff. Rather than lamenting that her kiss will not reach Allegretto at the top, If I blow him a kiss, I wonder, will it reach him up there? No, I guess it won't. She instead chooses to believe it will, some way, somehow. If I blow him a kiss, I wonder, will it reach him up there? I hope so. I really do. She chooses optimism over pessimism, hope over despair. This choice is what brings life back to the world and restores the party to its status quo. Light in the face of darkness is an important motif in Eternal Sonata, one of the few themes actually explored through the gameplay. They're called Heaven's Mirror. They're like a reflection of the starry sky on the meadows. This is the only place they bloom in the forest. These flowers never bloom during the day, only at night. When the sun is up, they stay in their buds, but they're able to absorb sunlight with their leaves. And after night falls, they let out all the light they've stored when they blossom. It always happens at exactly two o'clock in the morning. But they're also called death lights. Death lights? The sun brings life, but the dark brings death. And these flowers bloom in darkness. So, darkness is evil, light is good. Whether you want to call them Heaven's Mirror or Death Lights, that's up to you, Frederick. But I guess, these days, pretty much everyone has taken to calling them Death Lights. Despite all of the horrible things happening in this dream world and in the real world, the party succeeds by hoping for a brighter future, for a better tomorrow that they create with their choices. The time for you to blossom has come. Because when you do, those big waves will calm down. Do you remember? It may be you said it was up to me whether I wanted to call them Heaven's Mirror will bring joy to the death the the means the most to you. Really? I'm still allowed to choose, am I not? Okay! I shall make my definitive choice right now. It's insulting to that flower so that so resembles you. That flower that only challenges the darkness. I choose to call it Heaven's Mirror. I find this final moment and final message admirable in its genuineness and boldness. One quote from Hatsushiba explains why the general message of the game is able to resonate so deeply. Human lives are all of a limited time, but normally people don't like to think about this sort of thing. If you are ill and realize your life is near to an end, you will probably think about what life means deeply for the first time. 
This game's theme is life, so I wanted players to think about this. However, we didn't intend to emphasize the tragic side of the story. Eternal Sonata directly confronts death and tries to empathize with a scarily common experience, that of knowing you're near the end of your life. While it can be a bit ham-fisted with its approach, this attempt was incredibly unique for the time and still is within the AAA game space. One moment that really exemplifies this attempt to try to find a brighter side to life even in the face of death is in the credits. They appear after Polka jumps, but before she is reincarnated. During the sequence, the characters appear in a black void, floating in and out of frame. During their time on screen, they speak words of wisdom and encouragement. They relate their situations in the game and ask you hypothetical questions related to them. This is the most direct form of philosophizing, and I believe it serves to get you to think about the character's final choices and how it could relate to your own life. They ask questions like, who would willingly choose to die? Who would follow a destiny that seems hopeless? How can you live a successful and impactful life if you don't take the chance to do so? How do you best use your limited time on this earth? What will ultimately be our legacy? This moment feels clearly inspired by Neon Genesis Evangelion, and while I believe that anime does a much better job of exploring these themes and sets up this talking hand ending a little bit better, I believe Eternal Sonata still creates something impactful when viewed in context. Despite my problems with the story and the gameplay, I still think about these final moments and have taken some time to consider their meaning. That's more than I can say for most games I've played with more direct and predictable conclusions. This game is not perfect, nor do I think it really strives to be. It's a game made with love that wants to spread those feelings of unbridled passion and creativity throughout the world. It may not succeed at everything it attempts, but it does try its hardest at every turn. Ultimately, Eternal Sonata is a game about hope and rebellion, of finding your own ways to create your own reality and future, of not relying on others to determine the future for you. Even if you're on the verge of death, even if you have limited time, you can still make your life your own. The mere fact that this game exists is a testament to the power of its message. It's a JRPG that steps to the beat of its own drum, and it will play long into the night through the hearts of those it has touched. Their memories and connection with this game will allow it to live on, just like the works of the eternal Frederick Chopin. I know what it feels like to have a future filled with doubt. To feel overwhelmed. To think it's all over. To want to give up on everything. But... There's no use just thinking about it. You can't hesitate. You need to act upon it. Since in the end, all you can do is try as hard as you can. You don't have to rush. There's still time. You have infinite potential after all. I promise you, even now, you can still do it. All you have to do is the very best you can. I guarantee you still have time. Hey there, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, this was a real labor of love. Um, I tried a lot of different techniques with this video uh, and it was especially interesting to talk about a game that while I may not have fully loved it was a joy to talk about it um, if you want to see more reviews like this of xbox 360 games or really uh, artsy films uh, please make sure to subscribe to my channel um, and, and check out some of the other videos i have um, if you enjoyed this video please like it and share it around if you want if you want more people to see it um, and please make sure to come back next time where we will be talking about lost odyssey uh, which is the other Mist Walker JRPG on the Xbox 360, and one game that I have been dying to play for a long time. Uh, but either way, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye bye.